Well, we're going to have a look at Psalm 46, and I know that um, some of you have been looking at this in your groups through the week. Some of you have been uh, humming along to uh, tunes of Psalm 46. I haven't been able to get Dam Busters March out of my head uh, all week. Um, I grew up uh, singing songs from the Methodist hymn book, and I think there's one by Martin Luther in there, A Mighty Stronghold is Our God. And I've discovered since that there's a whole stack of music that's actually based on this particular psalm. Uh, Well, let's pray uh, that God will uh, teach us and encourage us as we look at it together. Let's pray. Loving Father, we do uh, come before you as uh, your humble children, knowing that we need you desperately. Uh, Please forgive us for thinking that we can cope on our own. And we pray that as we look at this psalm, you'll point our heads and our hearts uh, to your son, Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Uh, Well, I know that uh, a few of us have been lured in recent times to come to the Mid-North Coast. Uh, We were lured by family, uh, by the temperature. We came from Canberra. Um, We were told that Port Macquarie had the most temperate climate uh, in Australia and thought that's what we need, not the extremes of uh, 40 degree summers and minus 40 degree winters. Not quite that bad, but it felt like it at times. Um, And uh, it was interesting that we'd only been here for a few days when we'd already heard things like welcome to paradise. And uh, it very much is a very pleasant part of the world. Uh, We can enjoy ourselves, looking at the scenery, uh, getting access to mountains and to the coast very, very quickly. Uh, We can probably enjoy a a fairly good standard of living just uh, in this area. Uh, There's no traffic lights uh, in Bonnie Hills. Uh, In fact, fact, I don't think there's any from Dunbogan until you get to Port Macquarie, is there? Uh, It's an excellent thing, really, when you've come from the eastern suburbs of Sydney to be able to drive unhindered, except on peak minute, which occurs around about 8.30 in the mornings on uh, Ocean Drive going into Port Macquarie. But many, I think, as they settle and live in a place uh, like the mid-north coast of New South Wales, have given no thought whatsoever to the one who's created everything, given no thought to God. And I suspect that there are a good number of people who think, why would I need God? We've kind of got heaven on earth here. I mean, we've got everything that we need. We're, we're happy, we're, we're secure, we're, we're comfortable, we're safe, we, we're enjoying life. And many people move here for lifestyle reasons. Why would we need God in the midst of that? I mean, if, if we want to know all the bad that's going on in the world, we, we've got televisions. I mean, we can look at what's happening in Gaza and in Israel. We can look at Ukraine and and Russia. We we can see what's happened with floods in Libya, with all kinds of atrocities in other parts of the world. But we don't have to turn on the TV. We can ignore it and just live as though this life is comfortable because it really is pretty comfortable. And into a comfort lifestyle, it's very hard to point to the need for God. And I imagine that many of us in conversations with family and with friends, with people perhaps in our streets, in the neighbourhood, would find it difficult to be able to persuade people that they're actually missing anything, that there's something that's not in their lives that would make a massive difference to their life. Until, of course, something goes wrong. Maybe it's the threat of fires or the threat of floods. Maybe it's the impact of a car accident or perhaps a serious medical diagnosis. Maybe it's the breakdown of a relationship or losing a job. Maybe it's hearing that you don't have the funds that you need to pay for what you need. Maybe it's, well, we could continue with the things that every day impact people in our community. No, we are very fortunate not to live in parts of the world that have been riddled by war, 
throughout the last 12 months or more, in fact, throughout the last century, in fact, throughout the last millennia or more. But we are not immune from the need for God. Now, this is a psalm which talks about where to turn in the face of fear and insecurity. Um, it's for the director of music. It's another one of the sons of Korah. It's according to Alamoth. We don't know what that is. It's a song. It is to be sung. And it's a song that we would do well to learn prior to things not going well. I think I shared this at uh, our church camp when we looked at Romans chapter 8, that friends of ours were given a copy of a book by Don Carson called How Long, O Lord? It's a book that talks about suffering and how suffering is a part of human experience. And more than that, it's actually to be expected by Christians. Friends of ours were given that book for their wedding. Um, it wasn't a statement about married life, How Long, O Lord? Uh, it was actually preparing them for some things that they could never have imagined. Uh, two very athletic sons. One of them has a heart condition and doesn't finish a national race. Another one comes down with cancer at 17 years of age. A daughter was stillborn to the family. None of those things they would have had any clue about. But the preparation of hearing from the word of God prior to the events that happened to them, prepared them. And I think Psalm 46 is intended to work like that. Yes, it might come to us at a time of real struggle. If that's where you're at now, I hope that you'll be encouraged by this. But if life's pretty good here and now, beware, because it might not always be like that, and it'd be good to take this to heart. <clears throat> In fact, I was talking with someone uh, just in the last few weeks, who told me that they were actually memorising the psalm. Not this one, it was actually a longer one than this one. And uh, I want to commend to you the value of learning scripture, that we might take hold of the promises of God for when we need them. Well, it's a psalm that introduces us again to the Lord Almighty. Um, or older translations might have the Lord of Hosts. It's a picture of the warrior God, the, the king who's in charge of the armies, the heavenly armies. And we're introduced in verse 1 to God being our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in trouble. And there's a refrain in verse 7, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And it's repeated down in verse 11, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Friends, it's important that we take hold of both aspects of what's said in verse 1. That God is our strength and our refuge. Because if God is just our strength, then there is no basis for anything other than fear. Fear. But if God, who is strong, is our refuge, then he's the one who can provide comfort in times of trouble. If he's not strong, then where is the help? But if he's our strength and our refuge, and he's ever present in times of trouble, there is great help and hope to be found in him. We also see a few other things here about God. In uh, verse 7 and verse 11, he is described as the Lord Almighty, the, the great leader of the armies, but he is also the God of Jacob, who is our fortress. You'll often see God described as the God of Jacob uh, in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's the God of or the father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but to be the God of Jacob, I take it, is to be the God who made promises to his people. He's the covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. 
And that adds another dimension. Not only is God strong and our refuge, but he's promised that if we come to him, we will find help. He's the God who is in relationship. You'll notice the word there is uh, the Lord Almighty or Yahweh, the king of, uh, of, of the heavenly armies. He is the God who made promises to his people. And this God in his strength is sovereign over this world. Um, I'll take you to verse 6. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice and the earth melts. It's a picture here of God being the one in control over all that is going on. He is the one who rules over the natural world and the political world. Look at verse 8. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations that he's brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields, or some translations have the chariots, with fire. See, it's a, pity here, a picture here sorry, of, of God's authority over the natural world and over the human world. Um, it's hard to know whether the pictures here of, of the oceans and the seas and, and the mountains quaking and so on is actually a description of the natural order or whether they're just images that have to do with moral chaos and, and the threats of people to one another. But either way, God is in authority over all that takes place and nothing happens that is outside of the scope of God's care. In fact, as we hear these words and we look at what God is in this psalm, we're reminded of Jesus. Look, look at these words. Verse 2, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, through it, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. When you come to the New Testament, you meet one who is in authority over the natural order. You meet one who is asleep in the boat and yet is able to stand up and tell the waves to stop, and they do. You see, here is a picture of power, but it's power that is used to protect. And we have a God who is sovereign over all, but intimately compassionate, caring for his people. There is the picture of God as the protector, verses 4 and 5. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. So the, the picture here is of the city and of life, the river of life in this city and the protection for God's people. And again, we have this idea of there being refuge in strength. But it also requires the destruction of evil. And so the picture of God bringing the wars to cease, of breaking down the enemy, because without the conquering of evil, there is no peace. And without the conquering of those opposed to God, there is no refuge. And so we have a picture here, really, of God being both Lord and Saviour. And, of course, when you come to Jesus in the New Testament... We see the victory of Jesus over sin and over evil, over death, over Satan, over all opposition. Jesus is the Lord, and it's because he's the Lord that he offers salvation. He offers refuge and hope and life. Friends, as we apply this psalm to ourselves, we turn to the New Testament and we remember that God has promised to be with us. Remember the one who was born at Christmas? Jesus, he will save people from their sins. Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus has come to fulfill this psalm. In fact, Jesus has come to fulfill every psalm. But we see here that God is present with us 
because he comes to be one of us. And as Jesus leaves his disciples to return to heaven, at the end of Matthew 28, he says, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. How? Well, by his spirit, the spirit of Christ, who is the spirit of God, God's Holy Spirit, Jesus is present amongst us by his spirit. God is present amongst us by his spirit. As Christians, God is our ever-present help. And that's true for us personally. No matter what you might face, what you are going through, what threats you experience, God is your ever-present help. If you're a Christian, then God is with you. He lives in you by his spirit and as the church God is especially present among us the Bible talks about two temples of the Holy Spirit one is the individual where the spirit lives the other is the church where the spirit lives God is among his people God is with us God is our ever present help God is the one to turn to and Whilst we may feel that God is a long way away, whilst there might be times when it really seems that God doesn't care, and I can tell you that I felt this experience greatly in the first year of my, my cancer. There were so many times when it just seemed that, that God was disinterested, that he was so far away, and it was Psalms like this and Psalm 62 that kept bringing me back and reminding me that God is near. That he is our refuge, that he is our strength, that he is our ever-present help in trouble. And that's the promise of God. You see, feelings come and they go. They're influenced by what's going on around about us. And they can be fickle, can't they? We can have feelings that are affected by the meal that we had last night. We can have feelings that are affected by whether people treat us well or whether they put us down. Our feelings can cause us to rise and fall. If we are dependent on our feelings, then we'll be insecure and desperate. And that's why we need to talk to our feelings. That's why our heads need to rule our hearts. That's why our memory reminds us that God is so committed to being with us that Jesus died in our place. And nothing will change that. If you're going through an experience in life where it seems that God doesn't care, remember this psalm. And remember... Jerusalem, just outside the walls where Jesus hung on a cross. In history, for real. It said on that cross, this is the king of the Jews. It could equally have said, this is the demonstration that God loves you. Because as we put our trust in Jesus... The cross reminds us every time that God loves us. He is our ever-present help. He is the Almighty who saves. But friends, there's, there's another focus here that takes us to another aspect of this presence and help of God. And it's the reference to the city. Look at verses 4 and 5 again. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. You see, the place of refuge in the psalm is the city. This is where life is found. This is the place where God is dwelling in the city. Now, I'll remind you of just the few things that I said about what's going on in the Middle East a couple of weeks ago where I said that the city of Jerusalem now is not the holy place. The holy place is the city of God. And the city of God is descending from heaven. 
The city of God is the new Jerusalem. The city of God is the bride of Christ. The city of God, well, come to Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 12, verse 22, the writer to the Hebrews says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And he's writing to Christians and he's reminding them that just as Israel came to the mountain way back in the book of Exodus, the mountain that they were not to touch, the special mountain where God would, would give his word of life to the people, but a mountain which threatened their death if they were to be so bold as to approach God on their own terms, this was only ever pointing towards coming to the true mountain, to the heavenly city, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. I'm looking forward to studying with you next year the book of Hebrews. It, it, it's such a wonderful picture here of, of all of that Old Testament finding its fulfilment in Jesus. And it's as it's fulfilled in Jesus, as we come to the city, that is, we come to the church of the firstborn. We, we come into fellowship with other Christians. We, we come to gather with those whose names are written in the book of life. We come to those who have received from Jesus' blood the forgiveness for all. All of their sin. Friends, Psalm 46 is a great comfort, but it's only a comfort for Christians. It's only a comfort if we will put our trust in Jesus. Because it's a comfort for the church of the firstborn. It's a comfort for those who find their security in the city of God. It's a comfort for those who put their trust in Jesus. And so as we reflect on this psalm, I think there's a number of things just to highlight as we finish. There's the reflection and the resolve of verse 2. Look, look at these words again. Therefore, we will not fear. Uh, that's, that's kind of self-talk, isn't it? I think that's what it is. Just like we saw in, in Psalm 42 and 43. Oh, my soul, why are you downcast? He speaks to himself. But here, it's not just self and neither was it then. It's actually to one another. So we resolve with one another. Therefore, we will not fear. I think that speaks to our fellowship. That is, we want to encourage each other not to fear. If things are just overwhelming, share with a brother or sister and, and be encouraged by them. If you see that somebody is struggling, put your arm around them and encourage them and urge them not to fear. How can you offer such hope? Well, because God is our strength and our refuge. And, and though everything might go wrong, the earth give way, the mountains fall into the sea, though our lives might seem catastrophically disastrous, we don't need to fear. God's got this. And, and then if we come down a little further, there's the encouragement in verse 8. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations that he's brought on the earth. Yes, we live in a world under the judgment of God. Um, the world has been subjected to frustration because of our rebellion. And so everything that goes wrong in this world, in a general sense, is the judgment of God being worked out on the creation. But more specifically... Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations that he has brought about, the making of the wars to cease, the breaking of the bow, the shattering of the spear, the burning of the shields with fire. It's saying a whole lot more than there's a ceasefire taking place in the war-torn zones in Africa or the Middle East or 
Eastern Europe, it's, it's talking about a much greater victory than that. You want to see the victory of God where he has destroyed the enemies? Go back to Psalm 2. The nations fight against God and God laughs at them because he's installed his king on the throne in victory. See, Jesus is the one that we are called to come and see. He's what the Lord has done. He's the one who's brought about the victory. And whilst our hearts are saddened and for our brothers and sisters in war-torn parts of the world, in persecuted countries, in places where it's incredibly difficult to be Christian, might be feeling that intensely and specifically in their own circumstances, the answer is the same for us all. Look to Jesus because he has won the victory. Come and see. And then finally in verse 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I, I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. Boy, I think we need to hear that. I need to hear that. I know that you probably need to hear that as well. Our lives can be so busy, so cluttered, so noisy, whether it's work or family or exercise or friends or sport or entertainment or hobbies or the beach or riding or, or hiking or travelling or holidaying or or looking after family, we just need to take some time to be still. We, we need to hit the pause button, seriously. Because unless we take the time to be still, we're just not going to be able to reflect on the godness of God, on the wonders of Christ, on the presence of God's Spirit. It's a great encouragement, I think, for us to take a moment, to take some time, to set aside some space, to be still and to know that God is God on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a term basis, on a year basis. And the irony is that we're so often so busy seeking to make ourselves secure and self-sufficient and satisfied and safe that we don't have the time to look at the one who can provide all of these things. And so we play a fool's game where we're chasing in the wrong direction, trying to fill up our lives without listening to God saying, I am God. And I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And he is the one who is our refuge and our strength. He's with us. He is the promise-keeping God and he is our fortress. Friends, I think we need to take some time to reflect, to pray, to, to read, to meditate, to memorise, to sing. Because we won't know the wonder of the powerful, saving God if we don't pause and reflect on God and what he is and what he has done. We get caught up, I think, in thinking that we need to be in control. And God's word reminds us that we're not. But we don't have to be because we can trust him. I think there's possibly a little bit more to be still and know that I am God than simply slowing down and meditating on his word. In Bible study during the week, a couple in our group had... I think it's the Holman Christian 
Standard Bible or the Christian Standard Bible. And it actually said, stop fighting and know that I am God. I, I think the original is be still, but it picks up on the context, doesn't it? He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. In other words, God's got this and he will win. So stop fighting. Stop your opposition to God. Stop living as though God doesn't matter. Stop ignoring God and not giving him the time. Be still. Be still. And know that he is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our ever-present help in trouble. And come to him. Thank you, Father. Amen.